Welcome in to another edition of Inside Carolina's On the Beat. I'm Tommy Ashley. That's John Bowman. We're sponsored by John, ugh, Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. All right. As you can see, there is no Adam Smith, so we're all going to do this once. Happy birthday, Adam. Enjoy your day off from On the Beat. He's definitely earned it, especially after a 9 o'clock game in the Smith Center. Uh, those games are brutal. That means long hours working to get all the content up. So Adam is off this evening. Jeremiah will be joining us in a minute. But we do have the one and only Evan Rogers. Evan, you were in that locker room or in that area post game. Those late, late nights are interesting, especially when they're trying to hustle everybody out of there. What was that mood like after they played so well in the first half and then came out in the second half and – Tried to lay a little bit of an egg there against a Louisville team that I just didn't think was very good. Yeah, I think uh, across the board, I mean, obviously they were first off happy they won the game. Uh, but there was a, a sense of accountability or a realization that they did kind of let things get out of hand a little bit there. Um, RJ and Armando both mentioned kind of, I think it might have been the under 12 right around that time when it, it got down to a five point game, just the, the huddle and how Hebert kind of got after them and their lack of defense. Um, and one of the funny things that Armando said was kind of just like how, you know, coming into this game, this was a game that on paper they should have handedly won and they ended up winning, winning by 16 points, but kind of the idea that he felt like they probably could have and should have won by more, but in that they had to, kind of tough it out there for a stretch in the second half, how there were learning points along the way. And, and just kind of in general, how the game as a whole can kind of just be a wake up call in terms of knowing they can't coast in the ACC, no matter the opponent they're playing, even if it seems like on paper, they are, you know, outmatched or something like that. So obviously, you know, the guys were happy that they, they won and are six and zero in conference play. But I think the impressive and important thing across the board about this team is, they're pretty good at staying in the moment and kind of taking things as they come. Um, and you could definitely sense that last night. Jeremiah, I want to get you in here. Um, Jeremiah Holloway has joined us. Adam's out, as I mentioned, with the birthday. Can't blame him there. Jeremiah, the mood in the locker room, I kind of felt like, and we talked about it on the post game with Sherell, which if folks are watching this and haven't watched the post game podcast, Sherell's great. I mean, Sherell has a way of just putting it out there. Like you need, like when you listen to Sherelle, you're like, that's how I need to feel about this stuff because he's just so on point. And we talked about it being sort of a wake up call to Evan's point, Jeremiah, is that they can't coast even when mm -hmm. they're beating somebody ridiculously. Um, and they sort of learned that in the first, in the second half. Is that a good thing for this team to sort of get that dose of reality a little bit, even in the win? but being able to see that it's not easy just because you're so much better than folks. Yeah, I would definitely say that's a very valid point. Uh, also, hello, everybody. Sorry I'm late, uh, everything like that. Uh, yeah, but listen, it's, it's ACC play at this point. You know, this is, the, this is the part of the year where, especially if you're North Carolina, you kind of have the target on your back being undefeated. Um, you know, you're, you're the team that everybody's kind of uh, gunning for at this point, and that would include a Louisville team that, you know, had a had a better offensive showing in the two games prior to to seeing UNC. Obviously, it's one where you would want to see them, you know, kind of go in there, take care of business early, and they got the big lead and everything like that. But you know, it, it did kind of seem like uh, the intensity kind of wasn't, uh, you know, there at the at the same place. But I think those guys know that, um, and I think those guys, you know, have an understanding of okay, they need to, you know, continually, you know, put their foot on the gas, things like or keep their foot. Uh, you know, on the gas and just understanding that. And I will say they've been consistent this year, too, of, um, you know, these conference games, anybody kind of having the ability to, uh, you know, kind of give them give them a, a, a nice shot, you know, necessarily. So I know for us, like, you know, we kind of look at it and we see it as, man, you know, you will see they shouldn't have a problem against a Louisville team. They shouldn't have a problem against the Notre Dame team or whoever the case may be. But, um I don't know, you know, when you get on that, when you get on that court, when you get on those 94 feet, um, you know, things tend to uh, uh, tend to change up a little bit. So, um, but yeah, I think it was good for them to to have a game like that, to be challenged, especially at home, a place where they've pretty much been unbeatable, uh, you know, to have a game like that um, and be challenged. I think that 
Um, it's certainly something that uh, that bodes well for them uh, now and, you know, certainly down the line. And North Carolina was challenged not just by Louisville, but by Hubert Davis last night. He refused to let North Carolina take their foot off the gas at all. And when he noticed it happening, he stepped in right away. Uh, I have this quote from his uh, post-game pref- press conference. It's kind of my, my quote of the quote of the week. Uh, he said, um, they're shooting 90% from the field. I said, it's hard to do that by yourself in the gym with nobody guarding you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say uh, <laughs> Hubert Davis has never seen me shooting in a gym by myself with nobody <laughs> guarding me because uh, I'm shooting like 20%. But I think that speaks to Hubert Davis's coaching style. He's preached the last few games and the last few weeks, intensity on the defensive end, focus on the defensive end. And there was a stretch last night where Louisville started to hit some tough shots. They started to put some pressure, some game pressure on UNC. And I was impressed with how UNC responded to that. I think part of it is it's a senior laden team. It's a team with a lot of experience. They've been there before, but also I have to give a lot of credit to to Hubert Davis. He pulled his team together in that timeout. I was really impressed with how UNC closed the game after that point. So I wanted to call that out as my quote of the week. Jeremiah, get in, get back in here with your quote from the week. It can be from the week. It can be from last night. It can be from the press conference with football, anything. Um, Cause of course there was a ton of it that came out of Monday's presser, but if we're going to stay basketball, then give me something from either last night or over the weekend from a Carolina player that somebody may have missed. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I could do it for basketball. Um, you know, one that I had, um, so obviously Jalen Withers had, you know, kind of a, a breakout game against his former team. He had the double double off the bench. So he actually ended up being the first uh, UNC player to have a double double off the bench since Brady Manick did it the year that he was here. Um, and I thought it was interesting that he really saved his best game of this. I won't say saved. I've, I've, I held off when I was writing about it on saying saved. You know, I, it's not like he uh, coasted to just wait on the Louisville game. So, but he did pull out his best game of the season uh, against. Obviously, uh, you know, his former team uh, and, you know, his, his former teammates. So um, one quote that I had, um, well, I'll do I'll do a couple of quotes from uh, from from Jalen Withers. So, uh, you know, he obviously had the the tee up quote about, you know, uh, I'll go ahead and read it. So his tee up quote was it was definitely special. It was great to not only have my first double double as a Tar Heel, but uh, to have it against my previous team. And then he closes with uh, I think that alone says it all. Um, and then there's another one. Uh, with Hubert Davis kind of wrapping it up, saying, simply put, um, he says, we just don't win this game without Jay Witt, as he's been calling him this year because they have the two Jalens. He said we needed him to have his best game of the season. And But the reason I bring that quote up, uh, beyond just the quote itself, it it is the – the overall impact that I think Jalen Withers has been having as of late. Um, I think for him – and I, you know, talked to him a little bit about it uh, when we got him in Charlotte, just adjusting to that role, adjusting to what they need of him. You got to think this was a guy that, you know, averaged 10 points a game his freshman year at Louisville um, on a, you know, a, a solid Louisville team as well. And, you know, since then, you know, sure, his his scoring numbers, you know, kind of haven't quite been up to there. But even last year, you know, to average nine points a game, to shoot 40 percent from three to now, uh, you know, the. The playing time is, has adjusted a lot and what they ask him to do. But um, I thought he really got to flash a lot of his athleticism. Um, he was able to, you know, have his activity translate on the stat line. So he was really able to score some points uh, and obviously get that double-double. So um, I think he adds another dimension to them, not just offensively, but I think defensively he could give them another. Like if he can be on the court 20, 25 minutes a night playing the defense that – you know, they need him to play and being active on the boards. I mean, he was playing at the five, uh, you know, a little bit more than usual last game. He's played at the five this year before with Ingram at that four. Uh, but I think if he's able to stay active and if he's able to um, just just play like how he did yesterday, regardless of stats, just play with that same level of intensity, that gives him another dimension uh, on both ends of the court. Absolutely. Evan, get in here. Give me a quick quote of the week that stood out for you. Yeah, this was uh, from Armando after the game on the topic of net rankings, Ken Palm, all those ranking systems that everyone loves to talk about after every game. Um, 
but I just thought this was a hilarious response from Armando. Um, so when he was asked, you know, do you keep up with Ken Palm? Do you keep up with Ned? I think it was, the question was proposed to him in a way of, this was a team you should have blown out. Do you kind of keep track of how maybe not blowing them out will impact your rankings in the net or in Ken Palm or things like that? And Armando said, I follow and I see everything. I know all the metrics. I look at everything. So we probably should have handled them a little bit better, but I think today there are a lot of good teaching points. And then someone asked, well, who sends you this stuff? How do you keep track of it? And Armando claims, he says, I get a sheet of everything. I see everything. I watch all y'all's quotes. I look at everything. I'm a subscriber. I just got it under a fake name. Um, so obviously there's a, probably a lot of joking and, and humor that goes into this, um, but kind of just on on the point of, the net rankings in itself, I think you saw last night, I think UNC dropped one spot in the net and then two spots in Ken Palm, which really isn't that big of a drop. Um, I think the important thing is, is when you're playing teams like Louisville, which is a quad four game, even though it is an ACC opponent, or a Notre Dame who, if you played them at home, is a fringe quad three, almost quad four game, the, the work that UNC has done in the non-conference play in beating Oklahoma, in beating Tennessee, and in, in just kind of taking par- care of business in that uh, non-conference schedule has kind of given them a, a cushion to where margin of victory night might not become as as big of an issue as people might think. This isn't like last year where you know you you saw people kind of become these net rankings experts and and kind of keeping track of all the quad ones and the quad twos and how that can change throughout the season. Um, And I think another nice thing in terms of scheduling for UNC is that they only play Louisville and Notre Dame once each. They don't they don't play either one of those teams twice. And I think that's important because just from a metric side or even just from a team standpoint, you don't want to play those teams at the bottom of your conference multiple times, even if it might help, say, your regular season record. Um, I think in terms of long term goals and what can help you, those are the kind of games that. You like to have as maybe a little tune up here and there, but that's not a team you want to play twice. And I think it all kind of just goes to show that this team is in a, a totally different spot than what they were last year in terms of just obviously the roster and also like the metrics and, and the ranking systems. And it's probably not going to be something people will be checking on a daily basis come, you know, mid February, end of February. Evan, I have some uh, thoughts about your quote of the night. Uh, Armando, I know, has a lot of NIL deals, but he's going to need more to pay for all these subscriptions. These things are not cheap. The premium subscription for EvanMaya.com, I think, is like $120 or something crazy. So I I respect Armando. I believe that he keeps in touch with the net and he visits Ken Palm and all that. I'm just saying, you know, be careful with your NIL money, because if you're not careful. It'll all go to these recurring subscriptions that you forget to cancel in April when you're maybe preparing for the NBA draft or what have you. I think that perfectly cues up as well, Tommy, the debate that we wanted to have tonight about Armando Baycott. Do you want to explain that to our viewers? Yeah, so we got, so I mentioned it in the chat while you guys were talking. We're going to have, since it's just a two and two, right? You got host on your left side or your right side, whichever your screen looks like, and then you've got beat guys on the right. We're going to have a debate here. First of all, first debate is going to be Armando Baycott's place in North Carolina history. Um, his numbers, Evan, you wrote the story, his numbers continue to go up and up and up and up, and he's passing some legendary Tar Heels on the all-time list. And also the ACC debate. Um, we talked about the net and all the numbers right there. And, yes, those metric sites and, Evan Maya and all those guys, those are rabbit holes that you can get down in and explore. It is insane about how detailed they get. But it's also an interesting debate in how many teams the ACC might get in the NCAA tournament. We're going to talk about that as well as we get into it. So host versus beat writers. You got it, boys? So what's going to happen is whoever gets to go first chooses their side, and you got to argue the other one. It's just how debates work, whether you agree or not. So, Evan, I already know which way you're going on one of them, so I'm taking the one I want and force you into the other side of it. (laughs) Um, And also, we'll throw a poll up on the Inside Carolina YouTube channel, so I want everybody to do a couple things. I want everybody to like it, like the video, like you guys have been doing, but I also want you to vote in the poll 
at the end of all the evidence. Do not make a decision before the evidence is closed. Unless you just like one side better than the other, then you can pick it. But anyway, so that being said, let's get into this Armando debate. I'll let Jeremiah go first here. Jeremiah, your thoughts on Armando's place in North Carolina history. It's not just about numbers. It's not just about uh, ring, yeah, it's about rings, but it's about availability and longevity and all that. Where does Armando Baycott fit in North Carolina history, and do his numbers that he puts up deserve an asterisk beside them, given that he's in his now fifth season? Some of the guys he's passed only played three for the Tar Heels. Well, well when, we're, when we're saying, is, are we saying like where does he rank all time? Not sp- not purely number wise. Take that into account. Okay. Um, like everybody would would say, Tyler Hansbro is the number one scorer ever in North Carolina history. Sure. He's probably he's probably the most decorated North Carolina player ever. Um, given all the awards he's won, is he the greatest North Carolina player? I don't know if anybody okay. would would push him past Bill Ford. Those type debates okay. here with Baycott. So I think just kind of putting in perspective. There are, if I have it correct, eight retired jerseys, uh, like permanently retired jerseys in the in the Smith Center. So those are that's already eight guys, um, you know. But there's certain criteria to do that. You got to win Player of the Year, and and there's different criteria to do that. Um, then you think about some of the other just names that have come through there. Um, you know, it's hard it's hard to compare across position to. Like I wouldn't say. Oh, he's not better than, you know, Joe Barry. Like, you know, yeah, Joe Barry was a guard, scoring guard. Baycott's more of a, a big. So I guess you have to kind of consider it in those terms, too. But if you did lump in everybody, I would say you'd have to put him in the top 25 because you almost have to. The fifth year thing, I do understand. And I think the thing that's interesting about the fifth year is Armando actually asterisks those numbers himself. So, like, if you ask him about it, he himself will downplay the numbers like he's not going to politic to say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I rank this. I, cr- I crossed 2000 points. Uh, but at the end of the day, he did cross, you know, 2000 points. Uh, you know, they're not going to those points all counted. He played in those games. So, you know, I'm not going to uh, knock him for having those numbers. But at the same time, like you said, I mean, someone like a Charlie Scott played three years and, you know, he just passed Charlie Scott. That's just kind of, you know, goes into the greatness of kind of player that, that he was. Um, you know, like I said, I, I did say I wasn't going to go across positions, um, but you do have to think about a guy like a Vince Carter came out of here. You know, you just got to think about just certain guys uh, like that, however long they were here, you know, some of the numbers they put up. But for him to – he got the rebounding record outright. Like, he got that year four. Uh, so it wasn't like – it's going to be unbreakable when he leaves, but he did break that record in year four. He did play in the national championship game. Uh, you know, and he has been, uh, you know, in all ACC level of players. So it's, it's hard. To, and also you have to think in recent Carolina years, in recent Carolina history, a lot of their best players uh, were one and dones. You know, like a lot, they've, they've had a lot of guys in the last, I don't know, five, you know, maybe like seven or eight years that have kind of been one and done type players. So for him to kind of add to a to his college legacy and he might not end up being a guy where we say, Oh, XYZ came out of North Carolina and did this in the NBA. Uh, you know, he might not end up being that, like in that Michael Jordan Vince Carter class. Um, but you do have to look, you know, kind of look at the um UNC record book. So I would say I would definitely put him in the top 25. Uh maybe if North Carolina does, if they have a miracle run, not a I won't say miracle run, but if they have the run that they hope to have and, and get to a national championship and win it. That actually does that has to that has to shoot him up. Um, but right now, I'm gonna say a top 25. I think that's probably fair. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's a fair ranking. And also, one thing I'll just throw in before I, you know, kind of give it up. I will say that some of the UNC teams that he's played on, outside of the team that did make that run to the national championship, a lot of those teams didn't get off the ground much uh, in the regular season. Even that team that went to the championship. So this is certainly the best team that he's been on. This is probably the first elite team that he's been on. Uh, so I think that would factor in uh, as well. First of all, I want to just put this debate 
in context. I think it would be really helpful for everyone to take a look at Adrian Atkinson's pieces that he did for Inside Carolina in the summer of 2022. Uh, he, he's done it a few times, uh, ranking the top 100 UNC basketball players. So just to put this in context, when Jeremiah says uh, Armando is a top 25 guy, uh, George Lynch ranked number 22, Mike O'Corin 21, um, Bryce Johnson is in there as well, I think. Yeah, Bryce Johnson's number 25. So that's the caliber of players we're talking about uh, for UNC basketball all-time in the 20s. And I think Armando is ranked higher than that, and I think his stats deserve no asterisks at all because you have to put not just in context of how many years he played, but also the style of basketball that UNC is playing at this time. There's a lot of two big years uh, when UNC was playing under Roy Williams, where they were pounding the ball with a power forward and a center, a lot of post-ups. Um, then you look back at just how basketball has changed over the years. Um, so many more three-pointers now, uh, so much more jump shooting, especially when you look deeper back into the historical ranks. So Armando is a guy who might have dominated even more um, if he was playing in a different era, but he's still thriving this day and age for North Carolina in this uh, three-point shooting basketball world that we live in. I'm tremendously impressed with uh, what Armando is doing on the court, all the accolades he deserves them and, you know, climbing up the ranks and things like that. It's also a testament to his ability to stay healthy, which not everyone who's come through North Carolina has been able to do, especially big men. So I think you have to give him that mark as well. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Evan, turn it over to the losing side of this debate, um, <laughs> is I will say Armando's story is not yet done. There's a right. whole March Madness to go with him, uh, especially the way this team is playing. So I think he has a lot of work that he could do to add to his legacy. Wow. You give John Bowman the test before the before, the answers before the test, and he <laughs> knocks it out of the park. That was a great response. I agree with Everything Jeremiah said as well, the biggest takeaway for me is you got to win a championship to be considered a great at North Carolina. I mean, if you played somewhere like NC State and did what he's doing where they haven't won one since 83, and it's not a slight, it's facts, um, then he would certainly be way up the food chain with NC State. He wouldn't be beyond the ones that have won the national championship, and I think you're the same way at North Carolina. You mentioned George Lynch. Um I would wager – I would be interested in the chat. There's 150-plus people in here, and I might ask this when we do a post game where there's over 1,000 is, where do you rank George Lynch versus Armando Baycott? Who's higher on the list? That will be an interesting debate. But, Evan, your take on Baycott standing here in North Carolina history, here in, what, January, mid-January of 2024 when he's still got a half a season left to play. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Jeremiah mentioned the Raptors, and obviously you've got the retired numbers, but you also got the honored numbers. And currently, at, at this moment, Baycott doesn't meet the criteria to have his jersey honored. I think it's something of either a first or second team All America, an ACC Player of the Year, MVP of a championship game or Final Four, and I think there might be one or two more. But either way, he doesn't meet that criteria criteria right now. And I would make the argument that if his when his career is all said and done, and he still you know doesn't meet if he still doesn't meet that criteria criteria if he if he isn't an All American if he isn't the ACC Player of the Year, most valuable player of a, a title team something like that, I would propose that you should and and probably could make an exception for Armando. I think he is a player that deserves to have his jersey in the Raptors. I think when you take into account the rebounding record that he broke and, and whose record he broke specifically in Hansboro, I think that's enough to have him in, in the rafters. I think it's crazy to think that a guy who's more than likely, and I'm kind of on the side that I don't know if his records need an asterisk. I'd kind of prefer maybe a parentheses where you have his total career number. And then in the parentheses, you have his number through four years just to kind of give some context. Um, but you're talking about a guy who, who more than likely, barring health, is going to finish second all time in the in, in the ACC in rebounding. He's already over Ralph Sampson. He, he's probably going to pass Tim Duncan pretty soon. I mean, you're talking about all time greats and you know NBA Hall of Famers. So, how I view Armando's legacy is in a vacuum would just be the idea that 
he is a player that I think has garnered the legacy to where if he doesn't meet this criteria that's been in place for I don't know how many years, he is worthy of being made an exception. And that's kind of how I'll leave it. That's an interesting debate because if you're going to make exceptions, I think one of the biggest omissions in the whole thing is Ed Coda and even Kennedy Meeks. I mean, Kennedy Meeks should have been MOP in the Final Four in 2017. He won. And that would have got his name up there. Um, interesting names in the chat. Uh, Antoine Jameson. Jameson never won a title. They won ACC championships, but they never won an NCAA title. Got there twice and, and couldn't get it done for whatever reason. God, that was brutal. I was there. I say Jameson, Jameson was a national player of the year, though. You know what I mean? Like he was yeah. like he had he had the highest individual accolade that you could have, even if he wasn't on a team that was able to to bring one home. Certainly valid. And again, folks, Baycott's got what, twenty more games to, to set that record here. I, I think what you do when you rank I don't know if total numbers are a thing. Um scoring numbers i mean you can look in the nba at the scoring numbers but if you look at uh, rebounds per game i don't have the list in front of me john you're, you're great with stats you can pull it up if it you know per game if i played 100 games or more i think that's the best rebounder that carolina had whoever leads that list if it's baycott then it's baycott um but these guys had only had the chance to play three years and now they can play five. I think that's where the numbers sort of – it sort of brings into me, and again, I'm old school, is that you don't uh, you don't get credit for being there forever. You know, if Michael Jordan played however many years LeBron had played, who has more points? I mean, it's those type debates that go on on the highest level. But I think it's an interesting one. Baycott certainly one of the most beloved Carolina guys, and I would – I would say, and you guys would agree, a great interview and a yeah. great and a great ambassador. One of the, the quotes, one of the, the favorite as, as far as Tar Heel fans' quotes is when he was walking off the court at whatever game and he said he would die for that school and die for Carolina. That right there skyrocketed him into Tar Heel lore as one of the fan favorites forever. And yeah. um, Can I, can be, I ask – I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, can I ask one? And this is recent memory, so everybody would be able to kind of participate because I guess everybody would have seen. Would y'all? Who would y'all say had a better career between Baycott and Tyler Zeller? That's an interesting one. I have to do some research there. What do you think, John? I'm taking Baycott when you look at his overall career. Um, I think. Tyler Zeller uh, was good, but he had some really talented post mm. players around him as well um, that he might have benefited from a little bit. Um, you know, Baycott, like I said, he's been basically doing it all himself at that center position. Uh, he's been playing next to a different caliber of four uh, than Tyler Zeller was is playing next to. So, yeah, my initial take there um, is, is I'd rank Baycott higher. I also want to say just briefly – uh, Evan, to your idea about a parentheses next to someone's name saying five seasons, when when does it stop? I mean, if a player plays one season, should we put parentheses one season and then multiply all their stats by four? I mean, at that point, you know, Dewey Ferris would have the most three-pointers per minute played in UNC basketball, and you could times his stats by a thousand and make him the, if he would have played all these minutes, he'd be the all-time three-point shooter so respectfully i just want to say you know people play at carolina for different amounts of seasons you know some guys are here for two seasons and then they're off to the nba or they're here uh, for a season one and done and then they're off i think you have to just look at how many years they're in chapel hill regardless if it was a covid related extension uh, for five seasons yeah zeller won acc player of the year yep and he's been a pro I'm still not sure how Tyler didn't play in the league longer than his brother, um, but maybe that was a Charlotte Hornet thing. Timmy Ann mentioned, it's a great point, Baycott and RJ 
it, they had to deal with the pandemic. These guys that had to play in those pandemic years, those are crazy. I will say this about one and dones. I don't think you can be an all-time great and be a one and done. I don't think you can. You had a great season or whatever, but just because you're a one and done, I don't think you can be considered one of the all-time greats unless you were national player of the year or, or whatever, or won a national championship or the MVP. And I, even then, I don't know if you can go one year and be an all-time great. I think Baycott's going to be considered – I like the top 25 thing that you mentioned early, Jeremiah. I think that's probably fair. Um, but George Lynch, anybody that wants to rank anybody over George Lynch as a, is in that debate is – I have to question what we got going on here, unless Tar Heels can get it done on April 8th of this year. Let me take a second to talk about – no, John – you can do the Johnny T-shirt. I love it. You, you're so good at it. So you'll handle Johnny T-shirt. I'll get the one later. You are listening to On The Beat Live. We want to take a second to talk about our sponsor for this show and all of Inside Carolina's podcast, Johnny T-shirt. If you're on Franklin Street sometime this winter for a UNC basketball game, you step outside to go to the game and you realize, man, it's a little colder than I thought it was going to be. You can go to Johnny T-shirt, pick up a new jacket, any new UNC gear that you need. You can grab it from Johnny T-shirt. You can also check out their online shop as well. Um, we appreciate them for supporting Inside Carolina podcast. So we'd ask you uh, to give them some business whenever you're in the market for UNC gear. We're going to take a quick break. Tommy, I always give this quote to you. Let the national guys pay the bills. We'll be right back with a little bit more on the beat live. Perfect time. And we're right here at the bottom of the hour, Thursday, January 18th. Shout out to Johnny T-shirt and shout out to the folks that have joined us. Almost 200 here. Folks, if you're not watching the post-game podcast, make sure you get in on those. And if you're not checking out everything Jeremiah and Evan do, as well as Adam do on the site, Make sure you check out all that stuff. I don't know if, if anybody's in this chat that watched. We had a 1,000-plus people in the chat after the NC State game uh, last week, which is pure insanity. Had 500 last night at 1130 in the morning, or excuse me, 1130 at night after a Louisville-North Carolina game. So shout out to all the Inside Carolina folks that are just crushing it, joining us each and every time we do these shows. Let me ask this question. Somebody, people in the chat are talking about, and, and this may, th I think this is probably an age thing, but Tyler Hansborough or Phil Ford, who's the greatest Tar Heel to play the game? That's an interesting debate in the chat. I'd love to see. I'm not going to put that on y'all, um, but I'm going to throw it out in the chat. Tyler Hansborough, Phil Ford. It's a numbers and a championship over – what everybody considers the legend of North Carolina. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about ACC basketball. Carolina 6-0 and leading the conference. Jeremiah, um, we're what? There's 20 games in the conference, so there's six. They've got a, a stretch here going north, as the title of our show is Heading North. Mm. Um, first of all, is this league any good? How many – I and I think it's a valid debate um, – and your take on what North Carolina needs to do to be able to get a high seed here. I mean, what what is the standard North Carolina needs to set to be – you do not want to be a three seed in the tournament. You don't want to be lower, but I almost would rather be a, a seven than a three, just simply because you set yourself up to play some really strong teams, if that makes any sense. But what's North Carolina's uh, – path going forward to be a one or two seed here in a conference that's not good metrically like we talked mm -hmm. about earlier yeah um it, i feel like there's a lot to that conversation because when you look at the acc the most recent bracketology that i saw and take in a bracketology takes save those for later i'm just saying the most recent one i saw had five acc teams in it um, and I have to double check to remember, you know, some of the two of the ACC teams that were in there were first four teams. Uh, and then there were three UNC Duke being two of them that made the field just straight up made the field. Um, so that's where the perception of the ACC is that the perception is the ACC is a four or five bid league. 
Um, so that's kind of where they're at with it. Now, how that pertains to North Carolina moving forward, what, what UNC has going for it right now, uh, it beat Tennessee, and Tennessee has, you know, it wasn't like Tennessee fell off a cliff. Like, Tennessee has still, you know, it's only recently that UNC has been ranked ahead of them in the AP poll. So that Tennessee win is going to age well. I do think the Oklahoma win will age well, but maybe not to the caliber of the Tennessee win will. Um, and some of their losses that they have, I mean, really, two of their three losses are very, quote unquote, justifiable. That's probably not the right word to use, but um, even Villanova, they're not a bad team. But I mean, UConn, Kentucky, I mean, those are two of the best teams um, in the in the country. So your losses are, you know, to teams that could be anybody any given night with ease, probably. Um, and then your wins, you got some good wins in here too. Um, your Clemson wins, probably your best conference win as far as just, well, I know Florida State is, you know, whatever five and one in the conference, but at the time, uh, your Clemson win was, uh, would have been your best win. What UNC's got to do now is essentially just in as many games as they can, just take care of business, uh, night in, night out, and they're probably going to have to win a lot of these games uh, by double digits. Like, they're going to want to have some – if they want to get a one or a two seed, they're going to have to have, like, a plethora of just convincing wins, like 10, 15 points. Um, I mean, me and Evan were talking about it yesterday. Like, you play these conference games, like, you can slip up. Like, honestly, like, if they lost the game before they played Duke on uh, February 3rd, like, I wouldn't be shocked if they lost the game – before that, just because, you know, this is the part of the year where everybody just loses games. I mean, last week it was I'm trying to think it was what seven of the top nine teams lost to an unranked opponent. Like this is the type of this is the the part of the year where you get there. And even Louisville kind of, you know, cut it in close with them yesterday. So I think the path for UNC to get a one or a two is lose probably in the regular season. You probably don't want to lose any more than like two conference games. And that's just because of the state of the ACC. Like if this was a typical year where, you know, you felt like it was multiple teams, the ACC that could have made a run in the tournament. Okay. Maybe you could get away with losing four or five. I don't know, you know, but at least if you finish in the top three in the ACC, all right, you can get a, you can get a decent seed. But um, I mean, even Duke that one year when they lost to South Carolina, when they won the ACC tournament, they were like a five seed in the ACC, but they got a two seed in the tournament because the ACC was perceived as a much better uh, product. But now that they're not, I mean, I would think maybe you could get three, but I would think probably like two or three losses is probably the sweet spot to still secure maybe a number one or a number two. Um, and if you do have two losses, one of them better be to Duke, <laughs> you know, so, um, and you got to beat Duke as well. You got to get at least one on them. So um, yeah, I would think a very dominant um, conference run and in a pretty deep ACC tournament run. Um, and I think they're in contention for a one or a two. Yeah. I, I think to, to our point, we're talking about, you know, you mentioned Florida state, NC state's five and one only lost to Carolina, right. Florida state five and one only lost to Carolina. The problem with the ACC, Evan, is that if you do lose one of these games, Boston college is not an easy way to play, easy place to play. Um, you know, of course, they went to Clemson and won there. That's not an easy place. Virginia is never an easy no. game to play. But if you lose those games, it dings you so bad in the in, in the in the numbers that they rely on so much. And to Jeremiah's point, back in the day, you know, back in my day, <laughs> you had an ACC that was strong, and, and that's what's always the interesting debate for me is the Big Twelve. Um, Oh, they just beat up on each other. They're such a great conference, but they, you know, they may have five or six losses, but it's because the conference is so good and they just beat up on each other. Well, if the ACC does that, then everybody sucks. And, and you know, that narrative fits into the narrative of the of the metrics as well. So your take on this is what does North Carolina have to do? They go to Boston College and they've got, a few games, they got Wake Forest on a quick turnaround. Um, what does this team have to do to to keep their standing for a you know a high seed in the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I agree with the the loss total, Jeremiah. Later, I think seventeen and three is probably the the line is where I would draw it uh, for them to 
I'll call it the road to Charlotte because if they're one or two seed, they'd, they'd more than likely be playing in Charlotte that first weekend. Um, I'd say 17 and three, and then probably winning one game in the ACC tournament. I don't think you'd have to win the entire bracket, but I do think you could not afford to lose. If they were, I guess if they were 17 and three, they'd more than likely be the number one or, or right. bare minimum number two in the conference. So they get the double buy. And I don't think you could afford to lose a game against a team in that double buy game, but you could afford to lose a game against maybe in a, in a semifinal of the ACC tournament. Um, as for who those losses come to, I mean, kind of like how Jeremiah said, I think a, a split with Duke is necessary because that is a right now the only game in the ACC at home that qualifies as a quad one. Uh, Clemson was in that conversation for a bit, but uh, kind of in, in Clemson fashion, they've really fell off as of late um, come conference play. And yeah, it, it's a. Uh, it's a weird spot where the ACC is right now because I think in the non-conference people were pretty high on kind of the state of the ACC, especially in comparison to last season. Uh, you had Clemson there for a good bit who was undefeated and picked up a pretty co- quality win at Alabama. Uh, obviously uh, high hopes for Miami coming into the year. Uh, people were high on them. Um, but once conference plays come, you kind of just see the middle kind of, mix amongst itself like you guys mentioned you've got nc state and florida state who are five and one and i think clemson has three or maybe four acc losses uh which is crazy but um they're two and four two and four yeah so gosh i mean like if the season ended today there might be three teams in the acc that would be in the ncaa tournament and duke unc and i think clemson would still get in just because I think the conference as a whole has a lot of work to do. I mean, right now it's UNC, Duke, Clemson, and that order in the net. And then Wake is the next highest around the 47-48 margin. And UNC was ranked 46 last year at the end of the season and didn't make the tournament. Um, so I think they'll get to four or five. That would be my guess. I think five is probably where I could imagine them going to. But it's it's not a guarantee. Uh, the conference has a lot of work to do in terms of you're going to need some of the middle to kind of separate itself because having these teams kind of beat up and beat up on each other who may have not capitalized in the non-conference, whether that's Florida state losing to Lipscomb or NC state losing to Tennessee and then beating up on the Detroit mercies of the world. Like you, you had this middle ACC that, outside of Clemson and Miami, they didn't really pick up many marquee wins in the non-conference, which does the ACC no favors because that's when these metrics and net rankings initially come out. And once they initially come out, you have to do your work from there. Um, So I would say in, in terms of, you know, UNC in this discussion, 17 and three where you've got a split with Duke and your other two losses are, to the middle of the ACC. Like, I don't think you could drop a Notre Dame or, or something like that. And then just one win at the bare minimum in the ACC tournament, I think would secure you a, a two or one seed, which is kind of crazy. Cause you think about four or five years ago, you go 17 and three in the ACC, you're a surefire lock probably for a, mm-hmm. for a one seed, but it's kind of the, the current state of the conference right now. Yeah. I, I mean, it's crazy. Carolina cannot not, well, Teams like Clemson and Florida State and NC State cannot afford to lose to the bottom dwellers in the conference, or they're not going to make the tournament. Um, how much you care about that is a debate, but I think that the ACC, as it's currently constituted, needs more teams to make this tournament. Here's something else of a factor, I think. When you have teams like Florida Atlantic make the Final Four, I think that has the committee saying, whoa, we can put these other teams in. These teams that, that are pretty good that nobody really pays attention to other than their fan bases, they make these long runs. It's a great story. I mean, wow, it's March Madness. And I think that matters. You know, nobody wants to see Florida State go lose in the first round as a seventh seed to, you know, directional state. But they do want to see Florida Atlantic make a run. They want to see a St. Peter's that gets in, you know, for winning their conference. But you sort of introduce – 
the ACC being bad introduces more of these non-champion, quote-unquote, lesser conference teams that may have been number one in the regular season, got upset in the tournament, wouldn't normally make the tournament. They get in, and then you see these these great stories. I think it all plays out. I think the ACC is in trouble. I think you know, it's a different, different podcast, different story, but I think Carolina needs to get out of it as fast as possible. But as far as basketball, I think Carolina can ill afford to lose to anybody, not named Duke, maybe Florida State in the conference, and still be in line for a one or two seed in the tournament. I just think it, it is such an anchor to you. Let me take a second to talk about Congruity. CongruityHR.com front slash Tar Heels for you to get your small to mid-sized business uh, free assessment. You know, they they give Inside Carolina people free stuff. So you'll go and you'll put in your information. You'll get connected with a consultant. And they will provide you a free assessment to how they can help your smaller mid-sized business. If you take it, great. If you don't, you didn't lose anything. But you give a national-based company or a North Carolina-based company that's made it national based on the backs of their customer service, their technology, their ability to grow and expand your business, take care of your people while you do all the heavy lifting elsewhere. It's just a great way for your small and mid-sized business in this day and age where local businesses and small businesses are key to the, to the world, really, but to this United States economy and North Carolina economy. We see it on Franklin Street with Johnny T-shirt. We see it with Congruity. Go visit them, Congruity HR, front slash, congruityhr.com, front slash Tar Heels. Fill out that free assessment. Your Inside Carolina um, tie will get you a free assessment, and they'll take care of you. Darren and Matt and all those guys are great. All right, so we're going to wrap this show with some closing words. We're putting the poll, host versus beat writers, in the YouTube chat. I've seen 39, 40 votes each poll. There's 200 people in here, folks. So we need to see more poll, more votes. Evan, Jeremiah versus Tommy and John. Uh, how are we going to close it out? Jeremiah, give us your closing argument as to, uh, as to why maybe the beat writers need to take this one. No, just give us a closing <laughs> argument on Carolina. What you've seen, anything, anywhere you want to go here to close the show, I'll give you the floor. Cool. Um, well, I guess since we just didn't touch on it in this particular podcast, I do kind of want to touch on uh, the uh, the football side of things, uh, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we had the uh, the press conference the other day with uh, Ted Monacchino, who was the new defensive line coach, and he was brought up at – after being the senior defense panelist, and then you had, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Collins brought on as the uh, as the DC. So, um, you know, just kind of you know addressing it. I think one thing to kind of pay attention to: uh, this is the third uh, defensive coordinator under Mac Brown so far. Um, a lot of those guys are uh, are coming back. Shout out to eight two eight Lawson. Uh, you know, a lot of those guys are are coming back defensively. So, I'm very interested to see how those things progress or how that progresses. Can you and see, uh, you know, uh, create the identity that they've been trying to create for a half decade now uh, under Mac Brown. So, um, you know, but uh, obviously, you know, uh, you know, good talking to those guys and just kind of getting to know them a little bit. And also before I swing it over, I just really want to, I think we should all just appreciate how that last segment um, I think we all were, were saying some strong points, but I don't think anybody was listening because everybody was talking about who's better between Phil Ford and uh, and Tyler Hansborough. So, uh, you know, I hope you guys had fun with that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was good for us to get our reps in, but, you know, I think people were uh, a little, little uh, preoccupied, but uh, got to appreciate that dialogue as well. Hey, you know, <laughs> the the cool thing about these chats uh, to to sort of build off your point is that folks get in here and they talk to each other. Absolutely. And it's always civil in these YouTube chats. Yet I go to the message boards and I see these people that I've met in my human being life in the bowls lot specifically and they're just at each other's throats. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um you know, every thread devolves in the same five or six people just especially on the football side. Jeremiah, you brought up Monacino and Collins. It's just like, what are we doing, folks? <laughs> YouTube chats. I never thought that we would have YouTube chats that were much more chill and friendly. And 
sit around the campfire or the water cooler or whatever, just, you know, having a drink and chatting amicably, but it is that way. Preston from Greensboro, he knows where the bread is buttered. He knows to say to old guys. And for this purpose, John Bowman and Tommy Ashley are the old guys. Evan, close us out. Closing thoughts for you um, on this week in North Carolina athletics. Yeah, I'm going to take it basketball first, but shout out to Preston from Greensboro asking, will Des Evans get 10 sacks? Uh, obviously, that's a an old timey jab. It's funny he mentions that. Uh, Jeff Collins in his his opening press conference, when talking about when he was the head coach at Georgia Tech, someone asked him, "What did you think of UNC specifically their defense?" And the one player he pointed out was Des Evans, and basically said, "Those are the dudes that you want on your defense in terms of, of just getting off the bus and the first team all airport kind of thing." Um, but with the basketball team, I, I think it's going to be. Just another interesting week in two weeks really leading up to this Duke game. Uh, it's kind of another semi-road trip where they've got three of the next four on the road. Uh, and then the home game they have is kind of a, a tough turnaround going from Boston on Saturday to playing against Wake Forest on Monday night. And I think during this stretch for UNC to continue the the play and the trajectory that they're on, I think it's going to be interesting – who's going to step up maybe as that consistent third scorer night in and night out. Cause I think they are going to need that uh, to, to make a deep run. Um, I think you, you feel good about where RJ Davis is. Uh, you obviously know what you're going to get from Armando. And if you look at Harrison Ingram, his numbers have kind of teetered off a little bit here in ACC play, but he's, he's still doing a, just a lot of the, the everything that you want. Uh, he, he has a high assist rate. He's rebounding at honestly a, a career best in terms of just where he's at right now um, from when he was at Stanford. And I think you're seeing Cormac kind of get into rhythm. It, it, it's tough. You you see these games where he shoots like four or seven uh, against Louisville, and then he'll have, you know, a two to six, one to six, something like that. Um, so I just think, you know, the team is still not at its uh, – full capacity and i think that's a good and exciting thing um because i think if you look at a lot of teams around the country that are in that top echelon i could argue a team like purdue is kind of at its peak in terms of you know who they've got i would even argue yukon who who now is fully healthy you kind of know who you're getting out of all those guys maybe besides castle he's still kind of growing being a younger guy um, but I think with UNC, you, you've really only got two pieces right now who you can go in and expect 15, 20 plus points from RJ Davis, and you can expect 14, 15 points and nine to 11 rebounds from Armando every game. And then every other piece on this team, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get every night. Um, and I think that'll continue to get solidified, you know, as the year goes on. But I think leading up to this Duke game, um, there's going to be some interesting tests. It's going to be similar to that that road stretch they had early in the year. Um, and it, it might be against maybe the third best team in the ACC in Florida State coming up. Um, so it'll be it'll be very interesting for sure. Well, Tommy, I went ahead and uh, turned off the poll. I might have selectively turned it off at a certain point when I saw who was winning. Uh, we got 35 votes. You also do have to keep in mind there are some people who watch us on their YouTube TV like my dad, and I don't know if they're able to vote on the YouTube TV. So, but you know what the votes were, right? They were the 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 host fifty one, beat writers uh, forty nine. It looks like so it was it was close. Uh, it was very we, close. We stopped the count while we were yeah. ahead. <laughs> That's right. I, I I said I have Man. all the control here. I set the poll. I turned off the poll at a certain time. You know, well, I put an asterisk a, on that one. Put a parentheses uh, on that one. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And we're gonna have a trophy that has like parentheses around. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a bobblehead back here. I, I win. We win the bobblehead this week, John. There we go. I uh, I had a story, uh, an anecdote about R.J. Davis. I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, his big three that he hit last night. That I think kind of closed the tide of, of Louisville's run. I had a stat. Uh, that he's five of five from the free throw line last night, 67 of 70 for the season. And his pace free throw percentage is on pace to break the ACC record for free throws, which is just incredible. But when Evan started talking about seeding, it reminded me of this great story uh, from my time as the inside Carolina video intern. 
So Evan, you're probably, you know, never want to root for anything, but you're probably hoping that UNC is the one or two seed in Charlotte because that means you might get to go and travel down via car uh, to some of those games. So that's what happened for me. I forget if it was my junior year or senior year at UNC. Uh, UNC was a one seed or two seed in, in playing in Charlotte for the NCAA tournament. So I was really excited to be able to go and, and cover those games. You know, covering an NCAA tournament is really cool. Um, so we go down there and we get the chance to stay in the the media hotel, which is like the fanciest hotel, of course, that I've ever stayed in in my life, mm -hmm. uh, the Westin or whatever. You know, I, I put my credit card down to pay for the hotel or whatever. I'm like, OK, I have a few minutes here, a few hours, you know, I'm not going to tell Ben, but maybe I'll go out and play a quick round of golf in Charlotte. That sounds fun. Uh, so I go over to, to Sifford Golf Course in downtown Charlotte. Uh, I roll up there. It's a nice golf course, but it's not too expensive. I think it was like nine holes, $25, whatever. I go to pay and the guy says, uh, sir, we're not going to be able to uh, have you play on the course today. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, your credit card uh, declined. And I'm like shocked. I'm like, what in the world? I am not really familiar with credit cards and how they work either. Um, you know, I'm not sure. This is the first time certainly that I've been declined. I'm terribly embarrassed, especially to, you know, walking up as a single to go play, you put your card down. He's like, oh yeah, your card declines. So I think I just left. I think I just gave up. What ended up happening was the ACC media hotel was so expensive. Putting my credit card down for the hotel overran all my limits <laughs> for like the entire month. And of course you get reimbursed and things like that. Um, shout out to Inside Carolina for always taking care of us. But that one payment to the Westin for the ACC Media Hotel shot me out for the entire week. So I had to live off of uh, ACC Media food and I was not able to play golf because I could not afford it because my card had hit his limit. So that just reminded me of that story, Evan. Uh, if you go down to Charlotte for UNC as the one or two seed, uh, just be careful. Uh, that's all I'm saying. That is awesome. I, I had one decline at the, uh, the hotel, the residence in right there beside the the football stadium, the Panther Stadium, and uh, they declined my card, and I was like, well, I'm in trouble uh, because I don't have another one. And then my better half took care of it, but I called, and they were like, did you buy plane tickets in Spain <laughs> last night? And I was like, yeah, no, I didn't do that. And they were like, well, we canceled it. Mm. Between that and getting a card declined in Walmart, that's a rough day, boy, when you got a cart full of stuff in Walmart, and they uh -huh. throw up the red lights flashing Anyway, I, I will say this, and, and shout out to Jeremiah and Evan for joining us, and shout out to Adam, who's on his birthday evening. I hope he's having a great time, and shout out to John for being here. Stay tuned to Inside Carolina for all the coverage. Um, if you haven't watched Justin Jackson's podcast, we've had it. Taylor Vip with Joel Berry earlier in the week. If you haven't read Evan and Jeremiah's work off of, you know, they cover all these games, but they also knock, knock out great articles. Also, big deal NIL stuff's going on. You know, Bubba Cunningham and John Montgomery with the Rams Club. They're sending emails and all. Go check out all the inside NIL stories. Check out Joey's interviews with uh, TJ Besner with the secondary break and also with uh, Graham Boone with Hills for Life. Just a ton of stuff at uh, Inside Carolina for you to check out. Carolina plays at 2.15 on Saturday. Who's going? Are y'all both going or just you, Jeremiah? You and Adam? Actually, uh, Adam and Jim are going to that one. Okay. But I'm going to do I'm gonna do the uh, women's basketball game on Sunday. Nice. So you get to stay down here in a little bit of cool. Well, it's going to be cold this weekend here, <laughs> so I can't imagine what it will be like in Boston. Shout out uh, to the uh, women's team, too. They had a big win tonight against Georgia Tech, 5-1 and one in ACC play. Yeah, it is, it's Carolina, both basketball teams mm -hmm. are doing it this year, and it, it's always a great follow. And shout out to Jeremiah for covering them, you know, more so than we've ever had coverage. Speaking of that, we got baseball coverage coming up. Media mm -hmm. Day for Baseball is next week. It's going to be nuts here for Inside Carolina. We talk about there's no off season. There really isn't, not even during the seasons. And now we're going to have overlap with men's basketball, women's basketball, spring football, baseball tons of stuff going on and all these guys are the ones that take care of it if you're not a premium member join shout out to congruity and johnny t-shirt for sponsoring us they always help us keep the lights on here and shout out to the crew and shout out to the fans that join us every week 200 plus tonight 
another great day at Inside Carolina, another great day in North Carolina athletics. We will be back next week. Jeremiah, Evan, John, I'm Tommy Ashley. Peace, everybody.